When you think of the Mount Rushmore for Survivor, most Survivor fans would include Parvati Shallow because her type of gameplay and character really changed Survivor for years to come. She was really the first ever winner in Survivor history to use her flirty attitude to get her way and specifically get the guys to do really stupid things. With her not only winning Micronesia, but coming back to finish second place in Heroes vs. Villains, two of the most iconic seasons in Survivor history, Parvati's aggressive gameplay from a girl who you would think is just a pretty smile has made her a touchstone player in Survivor history, and her gameplay is a strategy that most young girls have also tried to copy. I mean, in almost every preseason interview, you hear that young pretty girl say she wants to play like Parvati when asked the question which Survivor player they're most like. But with Parvati's gameplay being so renowned in the Survivor world, this has made other young women targets in the game and have been given the name Parvati 2.0 to even further their threat level. So for today, we'll be looking at the success and mostly failures of every Parvati 2.0 in Survivor. Now remember, the term for Parvati 2.0 wasn't created until Season 23, so while we will briefly touch on some previous players before Season 23, this list will mostly consist of players that come after South Pacific. When the Parvati 2.0 label was officially made a legit Survivor strategy among players to target young and attractive women. Now obviously while Survivor has always casted young and attractive women, I don't think it was until Parvati that they started casting women to not just be a pretty face, but to also have her play similar to Parvati. There are some seasons where there are multiple Parvati 2.0s and some seasons where there are none, or at the very least least hard to assess. For example, on the most recent season, Survivor 41, some people might consider both Sydney and Sarah Parvati 2.0s. However, I think Sarah was more casted to be the Parvati 2.0 archetype, while Sydney was casted to be the Firecracker Girl archetype, similar to Natalia and David vs. Goliath and Abby in the Philippines. In fact, there is an in-depth article that I'll link below that covers all Survivor archetypes, and the Parvati 2.0 is given the name the Femme Fatale. The list is actually quite small, and I do think there are other archetypes that were more geared for the Parvati 2.0 that I will be talking about, even though the article doesn't consider them to be casted to fit that label. And again guys, the Parvati 2.0 label can be pretty subjective, so I'm not going to talk about every young or attractive girl to play Survivor this past decade, but I will try to find the obvious standouts from each season. So after Parvati won Micronesia in the way she did, Survivor tried to catch lightning in the bottle once again, with players like Jackie, Sydney, and Marissa all being casted to hopefully play a similar game to Parvati. While not being directly targeted for being a potential Parvati, they were all taken out very early in the game. Now while Natalie White did win season 19, I definitely don't think she was a Parvati 2.0 as she was clearly casted to be the Sweet Southern Belle, which again is talked about in the Archetypes article. But after Parvati once again dominated Survivor Heroes vs Villains and officially became a legend in Survivor history, the Parvati 2.0 archetype became even more prevalent in Survivor, with in fact the very next season being an old vs young battle, giving Survivor an excuse to cast half the woman as potential Parvati 2.0s. But with Nyanka being casted as the Firecracker, Purple Kelly literally just being casted to sit there in her bikini, and Kelly B obviously not being casted to flirt her way to the end, I definitely think the Parvi 2.0s for the Young Tribe were Elena and Brenda. While Elena was mostly a dud, being on the outside the entire game and almost a unanimous vote at the merge, Brenda really shined this season, and still the only person from Nicaragua to ever be brought back. In literally the very first episode of Nicaragua, she used Parvi's flirty strategy to win over Chase and save herself at LaFleur's first tribal council when her name was being thrown around for being a potential threat. She was without question one of, if not the best strategist that season, as she and Chase controlled both the original and tribe swap LaFleur tribes, and was the catalyst to get the majority to turn on Elena and Marty at the merge. Unfortunately, her first half dominance made Brenda too big of a threat, and she was voted out at the final 10. The next season, we also saw a bevy of younger pretty women casted, although the reason for this was very obvious. Instead of casting a bunch of Parvi 2.0s, Redemption Island casted a bunch of Amber and Natalie Whites in hopes they would give Russell and Rob the numbers to dominate the game. Now while I do think Stephanie had some good game awareness, the real star here was definitely Andrea as she got into a showmance with Matt. And yet, for one of the only times in Survivor history, the male in the showmance was targeted over the female. And in a ruthless move at the merge, she had no problem writing her showmance's name down at Tribal Council and immediately sending him back to Redemption Island after the two reunited. And while I do think Andrea is a bit overrated, you can't deny her Parvi level of ruthlessness and flirtiness she showed this season, and is one of the more well-known cases of a female playing like Parvati. But then in Season 23, South Pacific, we saw the birth of the Parvati 2.0 phrase, and a phrase that still makes younger women shudder to this day. Ironically, the person who got called this was Michaela Wingle, even though I think she was more destined to be the pretty girl that did nothing all season, while Elise was the true player to be casted as the Parvi 2.0. And while Elise was targeted for being in a potential power duo with Ozzy, it was 23 year old Michaela who changed Survivor forever simply by just looking pretty. Now for some context, Michaela was put on a trial with Coach and Brandon Hans. Coach had obviously just finished playing with Parvati, and I'm sure Brandon had been told horror stories of Parvati by his uncle Russell, 
who had also just got done playing with Parvati. And with Brandon Hands obviously not being the most stable person in the world, I'm sure Russell's words stuck in his head and all he could think about when he saw Michaela was that she was a Parvati 2.0 and thus the phrase was created. I call her Poverty because she's using her seductive ways in her young girl attitude to kind of get people in and get attention. It's the ones that are good looking and seductive that you want to get rid of. Despite being seen as a target right away by Brandon, who then persuaded Coach into believing him, she was able to survive the first couple of votes on Apolu, and even at the tribal where she went home, she actually got one of the tightest alliances in Survivor history to divide in an attempt to save her. However, Coach and Brandon got Cowboy Rick on their side, and Michaela just missed out on making it to the merge. It's very interesting to think about how South Pacific would have played out had Edna been sent home over Michaela here, as maybe Michaela would have flipped unlike Edna, who stayed with Apollo despite being on the bottom. But either way, despite her not making a deep run in Survivor, Michaela's bad timing when it came to playing Survivor revolutionized the game for all females in her archetype. The very first season after the creation of the phrase Survivor One World, we got an entire tribe casted of mostly young, beautiful women. Believe it or not, it's believed that Kim was casted to be the Parvati 2.0 of the season, but obviously she didn't need to use any of her body to get her way. She just simply used her social, strategic, and challenge skills to dominate Survivor and win One World. I definitely think the real Parvati 2.0 this season was Chelsea, as opposed to players like Kat and Alicia, who were more so firecrackers. Chelsea is one of the few successful Parvi 2.0s, as yes, while she was mostly along for the ride with Kim, she still dominated the entire game with Kim and Sabrina, and in my mind, played one of the best zero vote finalist games in Survivor history. In the Philippines, we got three tribes and three Parvi 2.0s. For Matt Singh, it was Angie, a beauty queen who actually had a pretty fun run, despite only lasting three episodes. She instantly got into a showmance with Malcolm, which is pretty surprising looking back knowing the type of player Malcolm ended up becoming. And she also gave us the iconic cookie phrase. Finish that same sentence. If I could change one thing about this tribe. That we could have cookies. But nonetheless, she didn't really have much of a chance on the ill-fated Matsing tribe. On Calabao, the only thing memorable about Katie was her terrible challenge performance, with probes especially getting annoyed at her for whatever reason. Huge setback for Calabao. Here comes Calabao. Katie once again last one over. Katie struggling. Go. Calabao on their last bit of rope trying to get through that drawbridge. Still suffering from the beginning with Katie. The only Parvi 2.0 to make the merge this season was RC, and she was voted out at her first tribal council. However, she did have a pretty decent pre-merge run on Tandang, as she was in the Majority Alliance and was able to get the older and somewhat outcasted Michael Scoopin to join the younger players and herself, Abby and Pete, to create the Majority. However, RC became one of the first cases in Survivor where her looks offended the other woman on her tribe, with the feisty and outspoken Abby Maria being the culprit, despite being in alliance with her. Now, to be fair, this was more so due to the fact that Pete was starting trouble, but this conflict between the two made her an outcast at the merge, and when Penner played his idol, RC was borrowed out as a secondary target. And fun fact, RC hated Abby so much that she refused to be on the second chance ballot due to not wanting to play with Abby ever again. In season 26, Karamoan, we got a very interesting scenario, as pretty much all the women on the fans tribe were young and attractive. The problem is, they're all so forgettable that I can't distinguish who or how many were casted to be the Parvi 2.0. Heck, I can't even tell the blonde woman apart. If I had to guess, I imagine Ali was casted to be the Parvi this season. I mean, she did get Hakeem on Survivor after meeting him on Tinder after all. But again, these ladies are some of the most forgettable players in Survivor history and were all voted out in the pre-merge, really just due to circumstances and bad gameplay and not anything to do with their perception. The next two or three seasons, we got Blood vs. Water themes, which meant some potential Parvi 2.0s like Jacqueline and Sierra had their loved ones with them and weren't able to play like Parvati given the season. However, in between the Blood vs. Water seasons, we got Kageon, a season that literally put three young girls on a beauty tribe. While Morgan boasted about her looks and said she would use it to her advantage, she never really followed through on it, and in general, I think was more just there to look pretty. Alexis proved to have great game knowledge, forming the majority four on the beauty tribe. Unfortunately, being seen as most likely to flip and just being a threat in general, Solana sent her home, and once again, a potential Parvati went home right before the merge. The other potential Parvati this season was Jeffrey. And while not quite as strategic as Alexis, she obviously made a deeper run 
and was in a pretty good spot heading into the final seven before Tony flipped on her in fear of an all girls alliance. In season 30, we saw the oldest version of a Parvati 2.0 and so Kim. So was 31 at the time of Worlds Apart, but still definitely casted to be a Parvati like figure, especially being that she was a white collar personality, proving she knows how to get what she wants in life. And right away, Hakeem and So formed an alliance, although I don't think So really had much of a choice as Hakeem pressured her into forming an alliance with him and backed her into a corner, basically forcing her to go with the idol clue instead of the big bag of beans, which raised suspicion from the rest of the tribe. And unfortunately, even though Hakeem was the one playing too hard too fast, So paid the price for it being the weaker of the two and was the first person voted out of Worlds Apart. We also got some potential Parvi 2.0s on the other tribes in Sierra Don Thomas and Holly Ford, but neither of them really stood out much this season. In season 32, we saw the most successful version of a Parvi 2.0 in Michelle Fitzgerald when she won Survivor Co. Wrong. Now to be fair, if I had to pick one person from this season that producers casted to be the Parvi 2.0, I do think Anna was more so that target than Michelle, and for that matter, even Liz. But I mean, Michelle was literally placed on the beauty tribe, a tribe that is essentially based off a player like Parvi. So while the true Parvi 2.0s were once again both pretty much bust, the other potential Parvis obviously did pretty well this season. Of course, Michelle used her insane social skills and million dollar smile to win her the jury vote over the big move players in Aubrey and Ty. And Julia played probably the most impressive teenage game in Survivor history. In season 33, we got the rebirth of the flat out showmans from the Parvi 2.0, something we hadn't seen in a while. And after this, we really haven't seen since, mostly because of how bad and obvious of a target it made them. Biggie and Taylor not only formed an alliance on day one, but they had a showmance that was obvious to everyone in the game. Now to be fair, they did make it past the vote where Biggie's name was on the chopping block, and she and Taylor were able to side with the majority. And the two were sitting pretty on the original Millennials tribe. And when the tribes went from two to three, the Millennials had the numbers over Ken and Jessica. Unfortunately, Adam was one of the original Millennials who wanted Taylor and Figgy broken up all along, and it was an easy decision for him to flip. It's interesting to ponder what would have happened had say Jay replaced Adam on that tribe, because while Michaela did insinuate that the two had to be broken up soon, players like Jay and Michelle were really close with Big Tails, and the two might have made it to the merge in a situation like this, as crazy as that is to believe. But despite going home in the pre-merge, Vicky's presence lived on that season, as we immediately saw the rivalry of Adam and Taylor begin, which was a massive storyline in the early merge. So even though a Parvati 2.0 was taken out in the pre-merge once again, it really goes to show just how important a showmance can be in a Survivor season. In season 35, Alan Ball immediately went after a potential Parvati in Ashley. Remember, Game Changers hadn't finished airing yet by the time season 35 started filming. So Millennials vs Gen X was the most recent season on everyone's mind. And again, with Figgy obviously being a major factor that season, the young pretty girl in Ashley was targeted right away, especially when it appeared she and JP could be the next Fig Tales. Now, while Ashley was never in any real danger of going home on the Heroes Tribe, her name was thrown around. And it would have been very interesting if say Alan would have got the super idol instead of Christy, and if the paranoia of a showmance would have caused him to play his super idol on Katrina in order to send Ashley home. The other big candidate for Parvi this season was Ali, who completely dominated the Hustlers tribe, but once again was taken out right before the merge due to being too big of a threat. We also got Jessica this season, who I think was more designed to fit the sweet girl archetype similar to Natalie White, but even she fawned over Cole, and the two had a pretty open showmance out in Fiji, but once again, with all the big targets on the Healers tribe at the merge, the majority targeted Jessica instead. Although to be fair, it was more as a safe vote as opposed to targeting her because of her showmance and threat level. In season 36, Ghost Island, we saw a bevy of young attractive females that could have been casted as potential properties. The very first boot of the season in Gonzalez was booted over the weak link Donathan for being seen as too big of a threat. At the tribe swap, while not directly being called a poverty, Bradley insinuated that Libby was an insanely attractive woman who could get her way, and because of that, she had to go before the merge. But for one of the only times in Survivor history, the female under the radar threat was spared over the obvious male threat, and Bradley was sent home. However, Libby was gone shortly after. The other potential poverty in Jenna, while not exactly the best player ever, she was definitely a flirt, and we once again got a pretty open showmance between her and Seabass. But unlike previous showmances, this had very little impact on the season, and Jenna was taken out at the Final 10 Tribal Council, simply for being on the wrong side of the numbers. In fact, her boyfriend even wrote her name down. In season 37, we saw yet another showmance from the Parvati 2.0, when Kara flirted with Dan, now, Kara is such a fun case here, as she sided with Dan the entire way through the game and cut him the second he was in trouble. 
the ultimate poverty play. Dan pretty much had puppy eyes for Kara, and the two were a power duo on the majority Goliath alliance, and Dan had two idols that he would have played for Kara. But after the chaotic final 12 round where Dan wasted his idol on Angelina, Kara, who obviously didn't have the same amount of feelings for Dan as he had for her, immediately got the target off her back and sided with the Davids the very next vote when Dan was voted out. While Kara isn't a very memorable player, especially considering she almost made it to day 39, she absolutely put a poverty on Dan here, using him as a shield, getting him to do what she wanted, but the second she realized she no longer needed him, she let him go. Pretty damn ruthless if you ask me. In season 38, we got two of the most underrated Poverty 2.0 performances in Survivor history in Victoria and Lauren. Now while they didn't exactly use their looks and charm to their advantage, they were definitely much more strategic than you would think when first looking at them. This was especially prevalent in Aubrey's boot when she immediately was sold on Victoria's All Girls Alliance proposal, not suspecting sweet old Victoria could try to blindside a Survivor legend. Well, think again Aubrey. Fifth person voted out a survivor. Aubrey, that's three, that's enough. You guys are unbelievable players. Need to bring me a torch. Wow. Obviously the success of Parvy 2.0s have been pretty low up until this point, but these ladies were able to make it to the final six and five respectively against a bunch of super fans and returning players who you know were probably thinking about targeting the two because of their persona. Pretty impressive gameplay, especially considering they would have made it even farther had it not been for the EOE twist. But after the two Parvies had a very good performance in EOE, we got the same usual bad placements the next season as both Molly and Chelsea were literally the first two girls voted out of the game. On Vote Guy, Molly was in the majority alliance but unfortunately, her trio alliance with Jack and Jamal was seen as too tight, and being that she was the glue holding the three together, and, you guessed it, would be the biggest threat down the road, she was blindsided at Boat Guy's first tribal council. Then two episodes later, Chelsea made the big time mistake of being in a showmance with Dean and paid the price for it. Or, well, not exactly. This was a narrative the show put on to make it easier to explain to the audience, since this vote was so confusing. For some reason, instead of getting rid of the clear outcast in Karishma, Missy got a case of Big Moveitis and wanted to bring in Karishma and break up the power duo of Chelsea and Dean. But instead of getting rid of Dean, which was the plan literally 10 minutes before Tribal, she blindsided Chelsea, who was in her core alliance. So Missy not only wanted to bring in someone who was clearly flipping, but she pissed off another person on Lyro and Dean who wasn't even close with her to begin with. Simply a baffling move. So baffling that the editors went with the simple showman storyline instead. But again, the fact that an attractive young girl like Chelsea was taken out like this just goes to show how the Parvy 2.0 label can put a target on someone's back for literally no reason. Missy simply wanted to make a big move, and over the years, there's been no bigger move in Survivor than breaking up a power couple, and specifically taking out the Parvy type threat. I also think it's interesting that the show didn't even try to go into what Missy was thinking and just simply stuck with the showman's narrative the entire time. If Missy took out, say, Elaine, then obviously the show would have had to explain the boot in a different way. But when it's an attractive young female that's blindsided, they can simply make the narrative easy for the audience, as we have seen throughout the years just how dangerous a quote showman's can be. And the show made it seem like that was Chelsea's downfall. And lastly, the most recent Parvy 2.0 in Survivor ended in a whimper as Sarah was voted out on day three. She was mostly booted for her challenge failures and looking overwhelmed out there but I do wonder if there was more to the story, especially considering the entire episode was about everything JD was doing wrong. But either way, sweet little Sarah didn't even make it past one tribal, and the first Parvy 2.0 of the new era suffered the same fate as many women before her. So there you have it guys, the history of every Parvy 2.0 in Survivor. And again, this was just a general list. I didn't want to meticulously compare every half attractive girl and think about how production thought of them. This is just a general list of every girl in Modern Survivor that could have potentially been a Parvy 2.0. As you can see, the results haven't been great, with people like Chelsea, Molly, So, and Gonzalez getting booted far too early in the game. And the funny thing is, they probably all would have made a deep run if they had a mustache. That's simply the poverty effect. Whether these women are targeted for their looks, showmances, seen as a threat, or simply an easy excuse for the tribe to have an easy vote, most of these girls have had a rough run in Survivor. Obviously there have been success stories, with Michelle Fitzgerald being the most obvious, while players like Lauren, Jeffra, and Kara also had decent runs, but they are few and far between. So let's be honest here, poverty is truly one of a kind, and due to her style of gameplay, we might literally never see a game anywhere close to her ever again. Thank you guys so much for watching this video, and let me know in the comments what other archetype videos you would like to see me make. If you like this video and Survivor in general, then smash that like and subscribe button as I post weekly Survivor content. With all that said, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you next time. I'm the queen. <laughs> and usually the king does what the queen says anyways, so I'm cool.